Welcome to the Gruber Morning Show. Today, we're going to talk about uh, the Saudis. Have you ever wondered when they're finally going to run out of oil? Well, we've got some information for you, and um, I think you'll find it informative. Also, uh, is BYD bigger than Tesla already? We're going to find that out. And uh, in the, as the dominoes continue to fall, who are the next candidates to adopt the next charging standard? We're also going to talk about quick charging battery technology, some new news in the industry, and whether or not uh, quick charging is actually really that necessary. I'm Pete Gruber. I'm this Mark Schaffner. Good morning. This is another topic, so stay tuned here. So let's start with the Saudis. The current Saudi proven oil reserve amounts to 102 billion barrels. Well, what that means is that if the Saudis stopped discovering new oil fields today and maintained their current production level of about 10.8 million barrels a day, they would have enough oil to last for another 26 years. Wow. That's not too bad, some experts say, that uh, because they had predicted that the peak oil demand would be reached by the year 2030. Well, but Saudi Arabia is not just sitting on its oil wells and counting its money. It's also interested in new technologies and increasing its recovery rate, exploring new areas, and diversifying into other energy resources. For example, they recently announced the $110 billion project to develop the Jafura gas field, which could produce 130,000 barrels per day, of gas, liquids, and condensates. They're also building a giant solar power plant that could generate up to 1.5 gigawatts of electricity by the year 2030. Now, I asked Mark, I said, well, what, what, uh, you know, how much electricity are they generating here? And, y and you said? Yeah, uh, 1.5 gigawatts is enough to power one DeLorean to travel through time, right. or about uh, a million homes. All right, so it doesn't sound like they're heavily invested in the uh, exploration of solar energy at this point anyway. Not yet. I, I do think that uh, you know, they, this, the Saudis and their environment, uh, although a little bit dusty, is really ideal for solar energy, though. Totally. And then they say in this article, at least, after all, Saudi Arabia is not just an oil producer, it is also an oil price setter. Mm, yeah. And that's kind of evil the way they do that. The way they set prices is they just simply cut production. It's not high enough, cut production a bit, and it'll go right back to where they want it to be. Oh, it is it is evil, and I, uh, it's, we think of it as evil because it's to their advantage and not to oh, ours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but because the fact of the matter is, if, if I was producing 10 widgets and I could get $100 for 10 widgets, and I knew that I could get that same $100 for only nine widgets, uh, why would I ever produce 10 widgets Right, that yeah. I'm doing one for free? It makes sense. So they say it can change a record premium for its oil, especially for American and European customers who are looking for alternatives to Russian crude. In fact, for Saudi Arabia, the $100 per barrel oil is already here. And it just seems like yesterday, you know, in the uh, world of investing, $40 and $60 a barrel was considered a lot for a barrel yeah. of oil. And here we are sitting at $100 per barrel. Yeah, it definitely, uh, definitely is. And I, uh, this, this tweaked my interest. I, uh, I, I thought, okay, so Saudi Arabia has 107 billion barrels of proven oil reserves. I wonder how much oil they had, say, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, or maybe way back when. So I, I went looking, and I mm -hmm. found, a, to me, a very interesting research article. It came from... Uh, the Energy Exploration and Exploitation Journal. So it's an engineering journal for the uh, oil industry. And it's a report from 2001. This report outlines the oil reserves that were in the world in, a ta in table format between 1948 and 2001. And what I found is in 1948, proven worldwide oil reserves were about 68 billion barrels of oil. Well, that's less than the proven oil reserves in Saudi Arabia alone right now. Mm -hmm. uh, by contrast, the, the uh, United States had 21.5 billion barrels of those proven oil reserves, and Canada had um, 100 million barrels of proven reserves. Fast forward to 2001, the end date on the report. Um, 
United States had gone up in their proven reserves, even though they had been uh, producing oil, millions of barrels of oil a day for 60 years. Um, their proven oil reserves had gone up to 29.8 billion worldwide. Over a trillion barrels of oil were in proven reserves in 2001. Uh, Canada was still kind of sitting back there at 6.6 .6 billion, not a really a major player. But fast forward to 2023, we've got two pieces of technology that hit. You have the shale revolution in the 2010s. Right. And you have the oil sands revolution in uh, the 2010s also in Canada. Now the United States sits, with, sits there with about 68 billion barrels of oil. We're the lar one of the largest two or three producers of oil in the world. Canada has more oil reserves than anywhere else in the world except for Saudi Arabia and Russia at 168.1 billion barrels of expected oil reserves. Mm -hmm. uh, proven reserves are a lower number because those proven reserves mean you have wells that are drilled and they've found them. Mm -hmm. Expected reserves mean that they that the researchers are going to drill at some point and they expect to find oil, but they have not necessarily proven them out. Saudi Arabia's reserves are way up. Worldwide, we're at 3.5 trillion barrels of oil and proven reserves. And this is after talking for 30 years about how we're going to run out of oil. Right, right. Which, of course, is what we would love to see happen. It helps yeah. save this planet, but um, that's a lot of reserves. You know, I go back to the last century, and uh, I was there during the OPEC extortion in uh -huh. the 70s, the long gas lines. And, um, and you know, for me, the Saudis um, have re had redeemed themselves with their hefty investment in uh, Lucid. And I thought, what a wonderful segue for them to, uh, you know, get out of this planet-damaging method of uh, producing, uh, you know, fuel right. to um, getting into the um, into sustainable energy sources. Now, I would have hoped that they would have taken more of an interest in solar, you know, even though they're, they, they have a 1.5 gigawatt, uh, uh, you know, installation under construction. Um, they could do so much better, especially considering where they're, you know, where they're located. Yeah, exactly that in that desert located location. I I do commend the Saudis though. They're like um, many other countries in the world that are energy producers. They're trying to diversify. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, the other the other point that I would want to make though would be uh, when a scarce limited resource like oil uh, really becomes widely or even universally valued, people are going to figure out how to get more of it. Right. Yep. They're going to figure out how to find it. They're going to figure out how to extract it in ways that were thought of as impossible just years years back. And I think of the same thing. Is lithium going to do the same thing now with electric batteries? Mm -hmm. uh, there's been talk now for a, a few years how there's no way we're going to have enough lithium to build all the car batteries that need to be built to uh, enhance the EV revolution when you also include stationary power and so on and so forth. Yet, you know, the, it was uh, Central Africa. Then it moved to Central America as the world's biggest lithium source. Then we've had articles about how we can potentially extract lithium right from seawater. Um, and then we have the, uh, the find in Nevada that's now considered the richest lithium source in the world and, and probably the largest lithium source. We're just scratching the surface in that area. Mm -hmm. And so I don't see us running out of lithium anytime soon. That doesn't mean that lithium is going to be the battery technology of the future, though. Yeah. And it turns out innovation is not very selective, you know? Yeah. It is, it is going to play with the old technologies that we're trying to get rid of just as easily as it can with the new technologies that are in demand. By all means. Uh, YouTube, we've got a question from Italo Garcia. He says, legal. Okay. Thank well, you for joining us. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Nolver53 on YouTube says, good morning. Good morning, YouTube. Ramon Hurt, uh, Tesla um, says 1.21 gigawatts. A lot of exclamation marks after that one. He caught my Back to the Future reference. Okay. <laughs> 1.5 gigawatts is enough to uh, propel a DeLorean through time is what I had said. Highlander says, hi, gang. Good morning, Highlander. Glad to have you back. Instagram, CH215714N. Are they wearing the same sunglasses? Yes, actually we are. 
Uh, can you bring up a, a, a picture, Jesse? I was waiting for the sunglass uh, notion to come up, and I don't see the it's picture. It's in images. Anymore. Check in images. Oh, images. There we go. Yeah. Hang hey, on one sec. So here is yet another good reason why we may be wearing sunglasses in all of the Gruber productions, from videos to podcasts. And what you guys don't know is whether we're wearing these 24-7. There we go. This is something that was posted on Twitter, and uh, it was um, a post by Elon. He says, the irony is that my company is making brain chips. Well, if you notice, that might be another reason that we're wearing sunglasses. Because we have to keep the lasers out of our eye. Yes. You know, kind of like the X-Men there. And disclosing the fact that we may not be human, that we may be AI, and that we may be robots here. You know, you never know. Has has Elon planted chips in our brains and we just don't know about it yet? There's a good conspiracy theorist uh, notion, isn't there? <laughs> well, whatever the reason for wearing sunglasses, there's one problem that we have yet to have a solution for, and that's where are we going to store those sunglasses, Pete? Yes, good point. Well, luckily, we make these sunglass holders. They're for sale on our website for $79.99, minus 10% if you use code Richard or code, code Aaron. <laughs> I I think Richard is going to become a legend with the infomercials in our <laughs> podcast. Good job, Richard. The next Billy Mays. <laughs> yes. Uh, YouTube, Hugo2001 says, is BYD really catching up to Tesla and in what? Tesla is so far ahead. It reminds me of the Toyota. Is this a good segue to go into that topic? I think so. While you're getting that topic pulled up, I'm sure. going to read Highlander's comment. He says, BYD is a real threat or at least a competitor. Mm -hmm. And real quick, Pete, do me a favor. Move your laptop to the right a bit. Instagram is, uh, their feed is blocked a little bit. We can't see okay. you. Is that better? To my right. Correct. Yeah, yeah that's okay. a little bit better. All right. So here, here's an interesting article. Warren Buffett back BYD is just over 3,000 cars from overtaking Tesla as the world's largest seller of EVs. Now here are the stats. So they talk about Tesla's uh, disappointing third quarter deliveries are giving its closest rival, BYD, the Chinese EV giant, backed by Warren Buffett, um, an opportunity to swipe the top place in the electric car rankings. It turns out that Tesla sold 435,000 electric cars in the last quarter, Q3 of this year, while BYD, no, Q2, we're in Q3. Uh, we're in Q4, and they sold 435,000 cars in Q3. They did announce the results uh, about a week ago. And then BYD sold 431,000 um, BEVs, or yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. BEVs, leaving a gap of just over 3,000 between the two firms, according to the calculations from Bloomberg. So, as you had mentioned, Elon is concerned about BYD. Elon has called BYD the uh, most significant competitor that Tesla has at this point in time. I think he's right. BYD has produced 5 million cars already. And Tesla just produced their 5 millionth car. Now, BYD produces a mix of uh, battery electric vehicles and hybrid plug-in hybrid vehicles. And so that 5 million conti continues or counts both. However, BYD over the last two years has been growing at a rate of almost two and a half times the rate of Tesla. Mm -hmm. And that means that BYD is definitely a big competitor of Tesla's. Uh, they're growing faster than Tesla right now. We just don't see it here in the United States because uh, China and US are not on very good speaking terms and they amount of tariffs in order to get a BYD card to the United States would be prohibitive on top of the fact that you have all of the regulations and red tape to get a car certified here in these in the states. Interesting. You were also mentioning that uh, the rate of growth is uh, different than um, uh, between the two companies. Yeah, uh, BYD is growing at about two and a half times the rate of Tesla right now. And there's a couple of models of BYD cars that are proving to be very popular in Europe. Um, I didn't jot down those model names. I'm not very familiar with them. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about BYD is that they're doing what we're trying to achieve in the States, producing inexpensive, 
reasonable quality, reasonable reliability cars that people like, and they uh, they're driving them, and they're and BYD is learning and putting out a good product, mm -hmm. which of course is now accelerating the adoption rate yes. globally. Interesting company to keep an eye on. Um, YouTube Highlander joined us. Welcome. He says, just the way we found lithium and the volcano in Oregon, uh, USA. The volcano in Oregon is told to be the largest source of easiest and least polluting lithium deposits in the world. That's right. Highlander is exactly right. That uh, volcan volcanic caldera is massive. It's something around 40 to 50 miles on the Oregon-Nevada border. And we were talking about this last week. I, I don't, I'm not good with the terms, and so I don't remember it off the top of my head. The lithium deposits, especially one vein of those deposits, is so rich in lithium that it's, it's basically considered a second stage ore. Really? Um, and it's still in the ground as such. The, the first stage ore is where you get, get rid of the, the first level of chaff and your lithium right. goes up to, I don't know, 10 or 15% or something like that. Mm -hmm. And this ore is so rich that it's in a clay soil and it's already at that percentage. And to put all this in perspective, we may be moving away from lithium as these as these batteries continue to improve, and we have more um, efficient methods and in, in different chemistries, and even more plentiful, uh, you know, raw materials like sodium ion batteries that we spoke about. Exactly, sodium ion, potassium ion. Uh, more Gra use of iron, graphene. Graphene, yeah. Um, and we haven't even talked about or even touched on the fact of things like uh, solar energy. Mm -hmm. Solar cells that are, are, that are in the lab are supposed to be as much as a thousand times more efficient than the cells that are on rooftops right now. Well, if you have a solar cell that today can be put on a car and generate somewhere between uh, 50 and 150 watts an hour, uh, that's not much on a car top. But multiply that by a factor of a thousand, yeah. now you're between 50 and 150 kilowatts an hour you don't even need a battery for that. You're mm -hmm. going to be generating energy faster than you can use it, even if you're driving down the road. Amazing. So your moonroof no. could become the main uh, generator. I think Jesse's yeah, going to chime also, in here. Yeah, I also haven't said fusion in a while. <laughs> I know you That's haven't. That's right. <laughs> Fusion's on its way. Yeah. Uh, Instagram, Fabrice for Rafi says, hi, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, YouTube of uh, Ramon Hertz says, Pete is really Cyclops from the X-Men. That's right. Okay. That's right. And, and, uh, if you're familiar with X-Men lore, we'll just call you Scott for short. Uh, I'm not, but I'm, I'm definitely going to look that up <laughs> after this podcast. Thank you, Ramon. Uh, YouTube Highlander again. He says, I agree with Raymond. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, it looks like Nils is joining us. Um, he's saying long-term oil should drop due to the falling demand, due to sustainable transition. Yes, as prices drop, until only the countries with the lowest extraction costs survive. It's about $3 to get Saudi oil, I think. Interesting. Yeah, we were, we've been wondering about that. You know, as EV adoption begins to take over, um, the cost to produce and process, uh, you know, fossil fuel... Mm -hmm. Is, is constant. They're not going to be able to make that go away. So with these refinery costs continuing to operate, it seems to me that the cost of uh, fossil fuel has nowhere to go but up. I can't imagine it's going to go down. But um, your thoughts? At some point, there's going to be um, a reckoning in the fossil fuel industry. They're either going to have to figure out other ways for fossil fuels to get used that don't harm the environment as much as the uh, fuels do currently, or they're going to have to transition away from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. You know, I look at uh, Shell stations here in the United States. Uh, their Shell is one of the one of the big oil petroleum producing companies. Uh, virtually every cell sa station that's being built out now uh, includes at least some charging ports, and Shell has put together stations like Tesla superchargers where they have more of a restaurant than a convenience store, but they'll have no gas and only 40 to 50 uh, charge ports for electric vehicles. Interesting. They're, they're, they're all, they see the writing on the wall too. They see the transition is going to come. Mm -hmm. And we will get to that tipping point at some point where 
uh, petroleum becomes more expensive than electricity, I think we're closer than people realize. It'd be wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Nolver's YouTube, California wants everyone to go green, but the DMV is sure stacking up the fees for EV owners. They're trying to recover the revenue lost from drivers not buying gasoline. Yeah. We all knew that was coming, though. I remember when we first started, when I first start, um, started to drive EVs, I really enjoyed those uh, very low DMV rates, you know, for oh, the Oh, my gosh, yes. And the privilege of being able to use the HOV lane, even without a passenger, you know, just because you had a cloud plate. But I knew that those days were numbered. Yeah, here in Arizona, the cloud plates are still a thing, and I take advantage of that every day. Mm -hmm. um, the the DMV fees, I, I regretfully say, are not the same anymore. Uh, electric vehicles don't enjoy those privileges. Um, you know, to, to Nulver's um, point, though, if you remember we've talked about, there are like 16 states, it's not just California, that have raised fees for EV owners in a basically a separate EV tax. Mm -hmm. Texas was the one that comes to mind right off the top of my head. It costs you $400 in a special state assessment to buy an electric vehicle, plus $200 a year added to your car registration fee to own an electric vehicle. And that's all for the privilege of being able to drive the vehicle on the road. That replaces the gas tax. Of course, the thing is, um, it's supposed to be a replacement, but the te typical Texas driver only spends about 40 to $65 on their gas tax over the course of a year. And this in a state where one of the heaviest investments in the producing of electric um, uh, vehicles took place. Yeah. Kind of ironic. Um, all right, we've got a few more here. Highlander um, says BYD batteries too. Yes, that's true. Yes. Uh, and then Niels uh, again says, he, I doubt BYD will be a threat to Tesla due to the high cost and low quality, for example, airbags that don't activate, et cetera, et cetera. It could be a problem. It could be. They look okay, but corruption is so ingrained in China, whereas Japanese are at least honest. Um, you've got some good points, Niels. I, it, it's hard for us to say here in the States because we don't see BYD. Our, our government essentially blocks it. YouTube, uh, again, um, uh, Nils is saying, no sodium ion for cars, according to Jordan G, beyond me. Why? Yeah, we have um, we need him as a guest. We do. We Getting Jordan Gusecki on yeah. there would, yeah. be, uh, would be great as a guest. I, I, my speculation, complete speculation, um, sodium ion is not very energy dense. Mm -hmm. okay. um, it is maybe half the energy density of lithium, um, and that and that's that's kind of pushing it. Um, I know there. Are, uh, I saw something recently. Researchers at Arizona State University, right here in town, are trying a blend of uh, these metal salts. You know, sodium, lithium, uh, potassium. Uh, there were two others that they used. I don't remember. And they have come up with a blend of salt of these salts that seems to have a combination of high energy density and stability and lower cost. If that can make its way out of the lab and into industry, there's a lot of potential there because that would be about 20% uh, sodium ion and uh, it's about 60 or so percent lithium. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, got an article here from uh, Joey Klinder, actually. Um, he is um, talking about um, there are two new adoptees of the NACS standard, and it is Hyundai and Kia. They both committed to using the connector for all their electric vehicles in the U.S. and Canada. Now, the rollout looks something like this. Um, the um, fourth quarter of 2024, in the U.S. at least, is um, when Hyundai is going to adopt um, uh, the next standard. And in Canada, it's uh, the first half of 2025. Now, remember, these manufacturers need a little bit of time to ramp up, change the production lines, uh, you know, order right. new parts. And uh, so it's that is understandable. But what will happen now is both Hyundai and Kia will have access to more than 12,000 Tesla soup chargers across North America. And... Um, 
They plan to also participate in the increase of the DC charging stations. Um, so the official statement from the Hyundai global president and COO, Jose uh, Munoz, was that uh, our collaboration with Tesla marks another milestone in our commitment to delivering exceptional EV experience to our customers. You know, when I read that, the first thing I thought of, he was using ChatGPT4. Probably was, because, you know, ChatGPT has its own writing style. <laughs> it does, yes. Uh, once you get used to it, you're like, ah, that, that, could, that really could be ChatGPT, and I, that, I'm thinking it probably was. Yeah, but, but it was well said. Yeah, appreciate it. And um, then Kia is also jumping on board with this, and uh, they, um, yeah, they will be adopting the next standard, and we're pretty excited about that. Finally getting some standardization. By the way, the senior director of charging at Tesla is a Rebecca Tanucci. And uh, she, of course, uh, may have been using ChatGPT4 as well. She says, we're proud to welcome Hyundai as the latest adopter of the North American charging standard. Well, that's very good. I'm not, I'm not, I would have been surprised if Hyundai went and Kia didn't because they have the same parent company now. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I don't remember if Hyundai bought Kia or if Kia bought Hyundai, but they, they did have a merger uh, probably about three or four years ago. It's fairly recent. Okay. And now they have the same corporate parent. Um, uh, Pete? Yeah. I was wondering if you wanted to throw it over to Cass at the new station. I do. Let's throw it over to Cass and get her on the, in the limelight here. Ooh, so. Hold on. Are you <laughs> muted? Let's see. I got to add your mic here. Hold on. One sec. So you guys, I'm going to put back on you for a second while I get the uh, mic added. Okay, let's do that. We're glad to have Cass. Uh, of course, love having Cass here with us. She, um, she has relocated a bit in the lineup of the uh, social media staff here. And uh, my God, you guys look like you have 25 feet there now of uh, bench space or desk space with all kinds of equipment all over it. And uh, Cass does have a uh, expanded role at this point. Do you care to tell us about that, Cass? Oh, we're not ready. Not quite oh, ready. We're for not it. quite ready. Right. Once, once we're ready, you know, while we're waiting, there, yeah. I'm going to just insert something that we didn't even have on the schedule. Okay. Um, UAW, kind of the latest. Oh, yeah. Because the United Auto Workers, uh, of course, went on strike in mid September. Uh, we're interested in this in that it absolutely affects the electric vehicle world. Mm -hmm. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we said, hey, if the UAW is on strike for another week, people are gonna start losing jobs, uh, it's, it's gonna be kind of rough, and that is, that's happening. The, the news is not all that good either. I, I remember uh, mentioning uh, the last time we talked about this uh, that the maker of Mack trucks uh, had avoided a strike because the union leadership and the uh, company had come to an agreement. Well, the workers rejected that contract. They're on strike now. Mm -hmm. On top of that, uh, in General Motors, Canadian auto workers are now going on strike for General Motors. So not only do they have to deal with United Auto Workers here in the United States, but in Canada, uh, they're, they're one of the largest unions that works for GM has gone on strike. So there's all kinds of issues going on in our uh, traditional automotive industry here. It almost seems like there's a concerted effort to get rid of the ice manufacturers at this point. Yeah, it does. It, it, it really, really does. And, uh, you know, I, I realize a big part of this is, is the perceived resurgence of unions and resurgence of labor. And um, that, that I, I think that probably pay, plays a part of it. Politics is playing a really big part of this too. Mm -hmm. When the president of the United States, who usually is the mediator of last resort for these types of strikes, comes in after two weeks and stands with a picket line and says, you better go get yours. Uh, what a terrible political message that sends. It, um, yeah. The analogy that we gave, of course, is you're going to marriage counseling and suddenly the mediator, arbitrator, the counselor, the psychiatrist sides with your wife yeah. and uh, you're, you're, yeah, everything you've done is wrong. Yeah, it, it's just, so it, it's, it's not, definitely not roses and stuff yet. It does continue to get worse. It's at the point now where 
yeah, even when the strikers go back to work, there's going to end up being a ramp up period now. Mm -hmm. You know, if the strike had lasted a week, if it had lasted maybe two weeks, um, suppliers can can hold for that short of a period of time because they can they can go ahead and make product and make sure that it's ready to go into the pipeline. Um, after about two weeks or so, that's when the layoffs really start to hit in the supplier chain. And many of those uh, people who get laid off simply go and find other work. Yeah. And so it's not a matter of, uh, hey, let's call the team back. A lot of that team is gone. Yeah, they're not rehirable. They're, uh, they're satisfied in their new positions. And uh, yeah, they're, they are basically starting over again with long learning curves and uh, yeah. QC mistakes and all the rest of it. Yeah, and, they, and basically they come out and say, why would I ever, ever go do this again? Because, yeah. um, you know, there, there's so much uncertainty. And when people are fearing for their jobs because of something outside of their control, uh, that that just they find a new yeah they find a new profession yeah it just completely disrupts everything yeah all right um, Instagram Pixel underscore Swart says what makes Tesla batteries better than any other battery um, you know Tesla is definitely an innovator when it comes to EV batteries but they did not invent the eighteen six fifty cell or their early uh, battery pack designs. Um, the multi-cell design is definitely something they could be credited with, and that mm -hmm. was Martin Eberhardt, who uh, he and Mark Tarpening decided, hey, why don't we uh, try laptop batteries instead of these uh, antiquated lead-acid batteries and see if we can increase the range of the first EV, really, sports car, the T0. Right. Um, which became an extraordinarily successful design that a lot of people copied. But, um, and then, of course, later on, they went on to, uh, uh, you know, developing uh, newer battery technologies eventually. But you have to remember that a company like Tesla, which is really a tech company that um, has grown to the point where they have very deep pockets for R&D, and they're mm -hmm. in a particular field. It's kind of like Google. You know what they're going to come up with next, or Microsoft, you know, software packages. Mm -hmm. Well, Tesla's going to continue with creating and, uh, you know, innovating new ways of doing transportation and the products that go in it. Um, so we have to give them some credit. But in terms of the uh, technology, their technology being better, um, no one was developing battery technology um, or is currently like Tesla, to my knowledge. Um, you know, we talk about the Chinese companies to an extent, and a lot of that is a Me Too effort as well. Yeah, a lot of it is. Um, and it's not high tech, you know, a battery chemistry, even the newer lithium iron phosphate, lithium ion, uh, you know, the uh, graphene type of batteries, uh, the solid state batteries. It is not a complex technology. It's just dialing in the correct ingredients to make that cake, uh, you know, uh, edible. Yeah, I think the complexity that people are struggling with more than anything else has been scaling. Mm -hmm. um, back when, and I, and I, you're right. Mark Tarpening, I think, is the one that invented the modern EV battery, and isn't it because he was in laptops? He was familiar with. Yeah, they both were. They were, yeah, the rocket book business, and they um, yeah, that's a, right. Yeah, they needed a power source that was small enough to replicate what a book would look like, and it certainly mm -hmm. wasn't going to be a lead acid battery connected to a little, uh, you know, e reader type book. Right, that's right. They they were doing rocket books, and they were all so they were familiar with putting two or three batteries in series uh, to mm -hmm. to up the voltage, and they it, it wasn't a big jump for them. And that's the first thing that people have to remember is that when you're when you're jumping, you're 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 relying on past experience, and that past experience can be highly relevant. Uh, that's just what we did at Gruber Motors. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were we were UPS experts and had been for a couple of decades, mm -hmm. and then made the quick jump. But um, you know, for battery technology, I think there's probably more money going into research and development for battery technology now than uh, by several orders of magnitude than there before. ever has before. Yeah. And the whole reason is because, you know, if I'm Mark Tarpening, I, I go to Panasonic and say, yeah, we want to get some batteries from you. And Panasonic says, okay, well, you know, how many do you need? You, a hundred batteries will cost X and a thousand batteries will cost Y. And, 
And uh, if you're really a big seller, maybe we'll give you 10,000 batteries and they'll, we'll cause a Z. And you come back and say, well, can you do 10 million? Mm-hmm. Right. You know, the um, power tools business taught us that uh, these small uh, form factor, high energy density type cells were um, quite efficient and quite usable. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if you remember, power tools used to have a cord attached to them, your electric drill, oh, yeah. you know, your skill saw, all of that. And uh, companies like, uh, you know, Milwaukee came along and began to produce things that were battery driven and uh, great with a great success. And then other industries, you know, your shaver, for example, used to right. have a cord on it. Now it's got a lithium ion battery. I just changed my electric toothbrush, by the way. And uh, I realized that I've had that thing for 10 years. It was still functioning quite well, but some of the, um, uh, the plastic began to peel off. And okay. I knew that water was going to get inside it as it continued. So it was the plastic that deteriorated, not the battery cell or the motor or the mechanism. And that's the amazing part. That, that, mm -hmm. that's, that's truly amazing when you think about it because um, it wasn't that many years ago. I had an older shaver. It, it was battery, but it was a, like a nickel metal hydride battery. You had to be really careful to, uh, you know, when you're charging it, you had to charge it all the way up. And when you let it discharge, you had to make sure that it discharged all the way. It required some thought. Yes. You, you had to think about it. And if you're, and if you're, if your shaver was getting really low, then what you do is you just walk away, leave it on the counter, leave it turned on. And then that, hopefully that night you remember to plug it in. Right. Otherwise, your battery would be dead within like three or four months. Right. And you're buying a new shaver. And you know, Tesla, um, one of the um, uh, the Tesla people that chimed in a few podcasts back um, said that uh, legend has it that uh, Tesla actually went to Milwaukee trying to get some sort of aging timelines on the 18650 cells. Oh, sure. Okay. If you think about it, that was a brilliant move because... The, um, uh, the application of 18650 in automotive was a brand new, uh, you know, thing. Uh, prior to that, it was ice cars. And, right. the, you know, you needed a 12-volt lead-acid battery to start your engine. But, um, yeah, so even Tesla um, realized that there may be some uh, intellectual property available at those manufacturers that had been using this product and tools for many years me, the most impressive thing is when some of these really high power, uh, high energy things like skill saws um, now run on these lithium ion batteries. It takes a lot of power to get together a skill saw that is powerful enough to do the job that you want it to do. They draw, I, yeah, they draw seven amps on a 120 volt circuit, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a lot of power consumption. Yeah. So let's, uh, we'll go back. I, I know we're a little behind on questions right now. Highlander had said, I totally agree with Pete. There's going to be more iron in it. I think he was talking about the different battery technologies. Mm -hmm. That's why I stay in touch with my former employer, Cleveland Cliffs. Interesting. So another uh, news item here, um, and this is from South Korea. The headline is, EV battery material breakthrough could cut charging times to six minutes. And uh, it would also give cars longer range, they say. So let's see what this article is about. Um, they say that South Korean researchers have created a material that would allow EV batteries to hold more energy, charge faster, and accelerate the, um, uh, the adoption of EVs. The um, challenge was road transportation, mainly cars and trucks, which are responsible for 12% of global greenhouse gas emissions, they say, and almost a quarter of emissions in the U.S. So it's higher in the United States because we happen to have more cars, it seems like. Yep, yep. Um, so swapping out gas and diesel-powered vehicles for electric ones would make a big difference in the battle against climate change. They say it can take up to 10 hours to charge some existing EV batteries to 80%. Now, that's a pretty aggressive figure that uh, it doesn't seem to be realistic to me. 10 hours. I suppose if you go to a supercharger where, uh, you know, there's, there's not much energy there because everybody's using it. Yeah, I mean, um, 10 hours to get 80%, um, okay, I guess. I mean... It, you're going to start with a battery that's down around 10 or 15 percent 
and you're going to have to have a pretty large battery in your car because uh, a 240 volt uh, 40 amp charger, that's the common one that's in somebody's house, is right. going to put about 25 miles an hour into your car. But some of these cars have batteries that uh, can take anywhere from 250 to 400 miles of range now, too. Mm -hmm. They say that why EV sales are on the rise. They say there's still many drivers that are hesitant to make the switch because they fear their batteries will die before they reach their charging station. Range anxiety, in other words. Yeah. Or they won't be charged up fast enough when they finally get there. So, again, they're making a point for why this technology uh, should be taken seriously because it's going to improve that. Um, even if a station is always within reach, they say, it can take up to 10 hours to charge because some existing EV batteries um, or to, um, uh, they say, 80%. But it's not as convenient as topping off a gas tank, you know, three to five minutes and you're out of there. So what they worked on is um, increasing the storage capacity of these EV batteries. And the way they achieved that was they, uh, let me get back to this article here. They changed the, um, uh, the anode material uh, which is normally made of graphite covered in a copper foil. But these researchers at the Pohang University of Science and Technology say they've developed a way to get an alternative anode material called manganese ferrite, which can hold one and a half times as many lithium ions as previously thought possible. The key, they said, was synthesizing the manganese ferrite into a nanometer thick sheet or sheets, and this increased the surface area, mm -hmm. allowing for the storage of more lithium ions when the sheets are used as a battery anode. That makes a lot, it makes a lot of sense, except for one thing. Uh, first off, the, the improvements are impressive. I, mm -hmm. if, if I can go and park my car at a charging station and in anywhere from five to 10 minutes be done charging, that would be, uh, Really impressive and really cool. Uh, they are making an assumption, though, that uh, the people at ChargePoint especially have talked about uh, and have challenged. And that assumption is that EV stations need to be like gas stations. Mm -hmm. That there is a need to charge your car fast in six minutes or less, like you have on a, on a fuel tank. Um, I found, I found something in, in Barron's this week. It was written by Alan Root and wanted to give him credit for this. Uh, he's, he says that um, he talked to ChargePoint, talked to some of the senior management of ChargePoint, and he said that um, ChargePoint is trying to get people to rethink how charging technology works today. Um, right now, the assumption is that EV charging is like a gas station. You take your EV, it's full, and when it's empty, you go to the gas station or the EV station and you plug it in and you charge up, and then you go when you're done. The problem is with that, you know, that if it takes two hours to charge, you don't want to wait around the gas station for two hours. And they're saying that assumption's wrong. Even today, it's already wrong. Filling a car with gasoline um, is the same as destination charging. You park your car at a destination of some sort and you fill it with whatever fuel that car takes to move forward. And then once the car is full, you move on. But your car sits at all kinds of different places throughout the course of a day and the course of an evening. So what if every place where your car parked was a gas station? Yeah, yeah, okay. And um, so every time you park, you could charge your car. Mm-hmm. Go to a restaurant. You're at the restaurant for 45 minutes. When you come out of the restaurant, your car has 15 more miles on it than when you went in. Mm -hmm. Go to gro go grocery shopping. Spend an hour and a half and go what I what I would call my wife would call big grocery shopping. Go get your groceries for the next couple of weeks. Uh, come back, you've added 35 miles. Mm -hmm. Go home. Park in your garage, and this is what most people do today. Um, park in your garage. You simply plug in as part of getting out of the car and getting ready and going inside, and you come out the next morning and you're full. Yeah, it just is. 
And uh, same thing, parking at work, more and more workplaces. We are blessed here that we have some charging stations here for our electric vehicles. More and more places are doing that. Park at work. During that eight and a half or nine hours plus that you're at work, your car is charging. You pick up a couple hundred miles. You know, it, um, it is reminiscent for me of um, what we do with our Model S, for example. Um, when we get home, we plug it in. Mm -hmm. By the time we're done, we've got 230 miles range the next morning. Mm -hmm. You'd be really hard pressed to use 231 miles range in one day doing the normal activities that people do with their cars. You know, you go to the grocery store, you go to the movies, you go to a restaurant in the evening. You're not going to eat up 230 miles. And uh, then if you do, you know, then you would go to a supercharger or, you know, someplace right, where you get exactly. a rapid charge, which is an anomaly. That's not the norm. So, um, you know, unlike your ICE vehicle, where you're going to have to go to the gas station eventually, when you bring home an EV and you plug in, you've got a full tank every single morning. Every single morning without fail. If you were to think of EV charging instead of uh, the gas station model, think of it as the Wi-Fi model. Uh, when you have your telephone and you go into a restaurant, the restaurant has Wi-Fi available. Right, good You point. hook in and you have internet. Uh, restaurants, hotels, the local mall, uh, movie theaters, anywhere you go, if, if you want to not even use your, own, your phone's own signal, if you want to connect to a Wi-Fi network, you can do that just about anywhere. Mm -hmm. Charging is that way too. Uh, even on a, you know, our, our friend, Rafael Demestri, right. with ADE days, he went around the world in 2012. There were no charging stations back then, except he said, everywhere's a charging station. Mm -hmm. If he needed the charge, he simply looked up, saw where the uh, power cords were going, and once he found a transformer that would step down the electricity for a household, that's where he would turn, and he would go to that household and plug in. It sounds like the notion of charging needs to go through a paradigm shift. I, I think it does. You know, and uh, <laughs> Charge Point's business philosophy is to put chargers in place for people to be able to get access to electricity. Uh, they try to partner with businesses, with uh, hotels, with restaurants, with places, and they're not even always selling their units. They're... Um, they're they're trying to simply partner with the business so that the business can get the unit and get the, get the sale. I believe Cass is ready. We'd like to introduce Cass at this point and turn this show over to her. Hello, it's me, Cass. Um, I did look up some stuff about that battery that you were talking about, that new one that Korea was making mm -hmm. yeah. uh, by, what, QuantumScape? Um, it also says it works in any condition and i'm using air quotes with that just because there's always margin for error uh, but it they they had tested it at negative 30 degrees celsius which is about negative 22 degrees fahrenheit um and back in 2019 when we had that polar vortex i was living in illinois at the time um and i lived about an hour and a half away from Chicago and Chicago had gotten as low as negative 23 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 31 degrees Celsius. So it would barely be able to function there, but they were testing their limits. Absolutely. And by the way, Cass also, I was surprised, found this out a couple of weeks ago, speaks some Korean as well. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. That's enough, yeah. though. It's better than the rest of us. In this a room. lot better than the rest of us. <laughs> I also um, can mm -hmm. speak some Hawaiian, just because I am Hawaiian, and then I just speak a little bit of Spanish. Outstanding. We are teaching my 11-month-old granddaughter to sign as well, and she's actually doing better with that than she is vocalization at that age. Oh, really? Fascinating. You know, I've heard that Spanish phonetically is an easier language to speak than English, though, too. I did not know that. Um, yeah. uh, you know, they, uh, there are fewer phonetic sounds in the Spanish language than there are in the English language. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of that is that the English language has co-opted so many terms from so many other languages across the world over the last several years. Uh, but it's, yeah, definitely. And th Cass, thank you very much. Yeah. By the way, um, do any of you guys know what happens to your car tires when it's 45 below zero Fahrenheit? They oh. freeze. They break. 
They crack. They crack. Uh, really? They, they, yeah. don't, they don't necessarily crack all the time, but they do stay square. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would know. I've lived in Alaska. We've we've had forty five degrees below zero, and uh, and until your tires heat up from the friction from the road uh, of actually the friction that you encounter moving forward, you're you you feel you like you're spot. you have a flat spot on your yeah. tires and thump 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 thump. thump. <laughs> I bought cheap nylon tires years ago. They they were priced well, but they had the same problem. When you first took off, you had that thump for a while until it uh, softened up. Yeah, yeah. We've got a bunch of comments. We should probably get to some of those. Before we do that, the image behind us, we usually give you a read on what that's all about. This one was not AI generated. This was something Jesse found. And since we were talking about Saudi oil production and their, and their reserves, we thought we would put an oil derrick up behind us to uh, represent that uh, topic. Instagram. Hish Malcolm is giving us the thumbs up. Thank you for joining us on Instagram. And on Instagram, we do realize you're not seeing that background picture right now. We're working on that and hope to get that taken, uh, fixed and taken care of soon. And also on Instagram, Pixels War has a strong opinion here. He says, no, no, no. Electric vehicles are not the future. We'd like you to tell us then what you think is. Yeah, I'd love to hear what that, mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Pixel. Um, uh, if electric vehicles are not the future, what, what do you see as the potential future for vehicles and uh, for things that will help be a little better for the environment than fossil fuels? Yeah. You too, PYGKLB says, if I remember the plate tectonics of the area, this new lithium ion discovery is an ancient part of the plume that created the craters of the moon in Idaho and Yellowstone Park. Uh, would not be surprised. Yellowstone Park is uh, several hundred miles away from this plume, though, mm -hmm. uh, from this lithium-ion deposit. So I, I don't know if it's if that's going to be the case. But uh, uh, I, I, I don't know enough about the geography of, of that Oregon, Nevada, Southern Idaho, Wyoming area. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like we've got Ingemar joining us from LinkedIn. He says, fossil fuel companies are wrapping up their contracts for plastic production. By the way, Ingemar, um, I enjoyed your uh, recognition of a comment that I made in the AI podcast Sunday, where I fundamentally said, we are the ones that need guardrails not artificial intelligence. It's much smarter than we are. It's not going to kill the species like we do. And uh, so we're really the ones that need all of this uh, confinement and control. You know, I just thought of something. Uh, you know how uh, in there'll be two sports teams in two different towns, mm -hmm. and they have a, a so-called rivalry. Uh, one team uh, will use... Uh, it, it, and this especially is true in the case when one team dominates the rivalry for several years and the other team does not. Mm -hmm. The team, the, the lesser team, the, the, the one the that losing, is losing, losing all the team, time, yeah. is, uh, is constantly focused on the team that is the winner all the time. And the team that wins all the time doesn't even think about the team that loses all the time. To them, it's not even a rivalry. <laughs> Well, that's AI and us. AI is yeah. the winning team. Right. It doesn't even think about humans and the human race. We are inconsequential. Yeah. We, we're we're just there, and um, and we're the I've we're made the that losing argument. team. What's that, Jesse? Oh, Jesse's made that argument. I've made that argument to Pete before. He doesn't really go for it. <laughs> it's going to treat. I, I I use the ant hill analogy where we're the ants, and it's uh, it's just not even going to care about us at all. <laughs> it, it does not indulge in emotions the same way that we do. And of course, there are some positive emotions and some very negative emotions and, you know, compassion and kindness. Those are things that are yeah. definitely the, the what make human beings special and uh, unique. But unfortunately, on this planet, that is not the prevailing uh, mood. It is uh, not about coexisting, living in peace, allowing others to, uh, you know, exist um, it's more about, well, I mean, it's obvious. Look yeah. at the planet. Look at the planet and the wars that we have going on. It's, it's more, it's, it's more about that dominance. And the, to me, the scary thing about AI is that it is amoral. Uh -huh. It is, it is without good or bad morals. Right. And, uh, and if it, 
if it continues as it as it grows in its capabilities if it decides to make a choice that is detrimental to us as humans it'll have no moral compunction to stop itself from making mm -hmm. that choice yeah and that's that's the that's what that's scares the concern. people yes. that's what scares people yeah, it does YouTube Highlander, I live on the east side of Toledo, well, Oregon, Ohio, between two oil refineries and the nuclear power plant, and I'm trying to promote electric vehicles. It's an uphill battle and struggle, gang. Yeah. Yeah. Eric Charles on LinkedIn uh, weighs in. He says, EV, EVs cause more wear and tear on the roads due to weight. Roads are paid for via gas taxes. Similar to solar knocking out the revenue from power plants, Someone still needs to pay for the grid maintenance. Those taxes and fees will have to increase to maintain the infrastructure. Yeah, temporarily that, that makes perfect sense. Uh, Eric, I, I, I agree, actually. I think that makes sense. It's um, during the transition. It, during that, yeah, during that transition time, eventually roads will be built with a little bit better quality. Most road... Uh, maintenance is paid for, and road damage comes from big rigs. Yeah. Hey, guys. Yes. Yeah. Has there been a study, or have you guys ran across an article that shows and proves that EVs tear up the roads more than can, you know, more than um, ICE vehicles? Yeah, I'd like to see that, too. I haven't seen anything on this. I always hear as, this as an excuse not to have electric vehicles on the road or to tax them more, but I've never seen any article or any evidence or any anything done that proves this theory because i mean we've got semis on the road you know i mean eighty thousand pounds each yeah and for I, decades yeah and i've never heard i've never seen anything i was curious if you guys had ran across an article or heard of anything it's it, it's a good argument to increase the taxes isn't it i mean it, uh, it is yeah. it, this actually sounds like a really good cast project to see if there's anything she could look up there you go uh, about automotive weights um the, there is some logical sense to this, that heavier vehicles cause more wear and tear on roadbeds because of the uh, the pounds per square inch of weight that's on those tires. Mm -hmm. um, I we, you know, I, I I'm I'm positive that that has been uh, confirmed in the class eight trucks, mm -hmm. you know, dump trucks, concrete trucks, semi tractor trailers. But I don't know if it's been, uh, studies have been done for electric vehicles themselves. I see, like I'm just doing a basic Google blah, 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 blah yeah. right? And one of the first things that I see is it makes no difference if they are EVs or internal combustion. First and then it goes on to, to talk about like semi trucks and commercial trucks, which mm, is something yeah. that we had already touched on. All right. Okay. A bit more research perhaps, but first pass, it doesn't look like there is any kind of evidence of that. Uh, Nils is chiming in. He's saying uh, refining is not the big expense. It's the drilling and the pipelines. He says uh, Russia's break even is some $40 versus Saudi's $3, for example. They almost just stick a straw in the ground and it comes up by itself. <laughs> uh, yeah, Nils has got a great point there. Um... Uh, you know, the, and the Saudi Arabian crude is a is a certain class of crude. It's a it's it's called sweet crude mm -hmm. because it has a very low sulfur content. It's very easy to refine. It's easy to work with. And Russian crude is uh, famously known to be a sour crude because of the high uh, sulfur content, especially in it, and the uh, extra refining that needs to take place. This is reminiscent of the show in the last century that I I wouldn't be surprised if you guys never heard of it, the Beverly Hillbillies, but uh, they were living out in the country and Uncle Jed is out hunting possum and uh, he fires that rifle of his and it hits the ground instead of the possum and up comes crude. It's that simple to find in some places apparently. It did. Yes, it is. And any of you who want to chime in that like that show, I'd love to hear from you. YouTube Highlanders, same in Ohio. They're about to text the tax, the crap out of our EVs and EV charging. Yeah. yeah. Um, I love this comment from what Mega Wilderness on YouTube. Nax is just a plug. Yeah. Um, and by the way, it's the, it fits into a category like many things in life. 
it's not the part, the product. It's the fact that we finally have a standard and we're all using the same thing. Right. One is not superior to the other, but finally there's some agreement. And we don't have, you know, dozens of different standards. Um, so that's the benefit. I, I think that uh, one of the reasons that NAX has become the standard in the United States, uh, even though it isn't a SAE standard yet, I think it will be coming uh, by the end of the year, um, is because Tesla took the time to build a charging network that worked. Mm -hmm. And um, the other players that built their networks out uh, with the CCS standard, um, their networks didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, you know, we're talking 75 or 80% reliability versus 99.95% for Tesla. Everybody wants to plug into a Tesla's port. It was much easier for Tesla because they owned both products. They owned the the um, the items being charged in the charging stations, whereas the other guys had to try to accommodate a number of different uh, vehicles. Yeah, and that's that's a lot more difficult. It really is. <clears throat> YouTube T Barrera says, "I like the potential of the battery blade BYD produces. The problem is the dimensions aren't right for the Model S battery case." So it sounds like somebody is trying to do a conversion, and uh, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Mega Wilderness on YouTube has a second comment for us. He says, labor needs to support, uh, labor needs support to control the disparity of rewards between the top 1%. A lot of discussion there, yes. A lot of, lot of UAW discussion there. In fact, Fine has a T-shirt that says, eat the rich, so you can tell where his head's at. <laughs> yeah, I... You know, I saw him in that T-shirt, and this is this is just my little rant here. Is he a cannibal? Does he eat himself? Because I will <laughs> bet you money that he is among the rich. No, yeah, he, that's the ultimate irony. With all this fame that he's garnering, he's going to become the very thing that he would normally have eaten. Yes, exactly. Uh, YouTube Ramon Hurt says GM gave in to the UAW and let them into their battery factories. Do you guys think Ford and Stellantis will follow suit? I certainly hope not. But, um, you know, when, when you have companies like this that are over a barrel, they already have an existential threat, which uh, was there in place well before a UAW strike. I think that they're desperate and they'll grasp at any straw that they can to extend their lifespan a bit. But it'll be interesting to see if any of these companies survive both this um, EV adoption and the necessary conversion where they have to pivot to new technologies, new production methods, and retrain their entire labor pool and this UAW um, uh, wage demand increase. You know, I, I don't know in history if there's ever been a case where two parties that are contending against each other the way that the UAW and automakers are contending against each other right now uh, can ever have or achieve long-term success. Yeah. Usually long-term success is only achieved when both parties, uh, if there are two different parties, when both parties come together in a spirit of cooperation and try to make each other better. Good faith, goodwill. Yeah, yeah. and so that means... Uh, you don't have somebody saying eat the rich with the assumption that that the corporate uh, the corporate entity is being a complete hog about all of the wealth and stuff that's there. And on the corporate side, you don't have the corporation saying we're going to purposely pay as little as possible to our labor to try to make sure we can maximize profits for yeah. shareholders. By the time it gets that acrimonious, it doesn't seem like there's a long-term outcome or a beneficial outcome. Right. YouTube T. Barrera uh, says, might be useful for Model X due to ground clearance. Okay. Uh, Roger Starkey's joining us from YouTube. He says, it's not Tesla batteries, it's Tesla total system efficiency. Also a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. I think he's responding to the earlier question we had about what makes Tesla batteries so good. Yeah. And it, it is. It's, I think, the total system, not just the batteries, it's everything. YouTube Highlander says, if Pete hires me, I'll never strike. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. On YouTube, Mega Wilderness adds, uh, BYD seems more efficient than Tesla. 
I'm not sure if I would agree with that. I don't know enough to be able to give a really good, coherent response. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm not sure if I would agree with it is that BYD is operating in an environment uh, absent any kind of regulation to speak of and with the support of their government. Mm -hmm. If the Chinese government were to turn and say, nope, we're not going to support you, BYD, we're going to go support XYZ over here instead, how would BYD survive? Yeah, good point. And so there, there are factors outside of efficiency that are greatly influencing BYD's growth. YouTube Highlander says, I agree, totally keep the politicians out of it, let the market decide. And that was um, an earlier statement made about how the current sitting president actually, instead of mediating and arbitrating, took a, a solid polarized uh, position, and uh, which yeah. we actually created a meme uh, months ago. He was praising Mary Barra as being the uh, catalyst and the leader for the EV revolution. And then a few months later, he's um, basically, um, you know, taking a position against the company. Yes. Yes. Uh, Ramon Hurd on YouTube says, I wonder if Jeff Don and his team have some sort of battery tech that will be a breakthrough. Do not know. I yeah. don't know right offhand. Um, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the name Jeff Don. Um, I, I was assuming that that was a Tesla. Tell us more, uh, Ramon. Yeah, we'd be interested. Yeah. YouTube, Roger Starkey, BYD more efficient? Jorn Nyland doesn't agree, right? And uh, Roger Starkey is also chiming in. He says, Jeff Don and many others have many developments we haven't heard about. Um, you know, I, I think I've seen videos by Jeff Don. We'll research it. We'll yep. research yeah, that We'll one. get more information. So, Cass, that's, that's you again. <laughs> yeah. Um, George Lewis on YouTube says, it takes 30 minutes at a Tesla supercharger to charge. Yeah, which is about the right amount of time to go to Carl's Jr. and get a drink and a burger. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you go to fast food or... I, I like up here uh, at our at our it's called Deer Valley Center. Yeah, um, lots of lots of little restaurants around. Uh, everything's within walking distance. Uh, if, if you had a if you had the the need, you could even go to the movies. Yeah, that's right. There's a movie There's AMC. A movie. Yeah, think. AMC movie yeah. theater right there too. All right, YouTube Roger Starkey says batteries are going to be the wild west for at least the next decade. There will be a new sheriff in town every few months. Good point. New totally technology, agree. new chemistry, yeah. George Lewis on YouTube says you can simple charge at home and never go to a gas station ever again. Yeah. George for a number of years I've had a a, a Tesla that does not have supercharging available to it. Um, and it's just, we, uh, the, just the way the circumstance is, I just don't have the availability to use a supercharger. I don't think about it, ever. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, I, I totally agree with you there. Roger Starkey says, manganese ferrite sounds a lot like cattle's LMFP, which is lithium manganese ferrite phosphate. Would be. I think it's very similar. Um, I, I agree with you, Jordan. Now, YouTube, uh, Ramon Hurt. And by the way, um, he works for Tesla, and he's talking about Elon here. He says, will supercapacitors ever be incorporated into an EV? Um, if you remember, Elon bought Maxwell Technologies a few years ago, which was the uh, touted at that time as the leader in supercapacitor technology. And um, you didn't hear much about it after that purchase, but it's not uncommon. Oftentimes what large companies will do, they, they will assimilate and gobble up a small, innovative R&D type company that takes their technology to the next level. And we're hoping that that's what happened with, Max, with uh, Maxwell rather than just shell the project. I think the Rimac Nevera, the, that's $2 million supercar that has the uh, the really, really fast uh, zero to 60 times. And mm -hmm. I think it has supercapacitor capabilities or supercapacitors are put into that particular car. Um, the, the reason 
for that is the supercapacitors have such a high discharge rate, they can power the uh, high level of horsepower and torque that's needed in order to get the car to go forward. And it's, uh, what is it, 1.75 seconds, zero to oh, six crazy. time or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, outside of that, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Got a news item here. Um, the Tesla, it, it turns out Tesla plans to launch its own cell recycling pilot plant to achieve a uh, metal recovery on its own. It'll be located at uh, Giga, Nevada. And this is according to recent job postings. And and we'll give you some of the numbers here in a moment. But um, in January, Tesla announced plans to build two new $3.6 billion manufacturing facilities east of Sparks, Nevada. One will produce the Tesla Semi. The other is going to produce the 4680 batteries. This meant that Tesla... Uh, expansion at its factory in Nevada. And they claim that more than 3,000 jobs will be created at these two factories. Um, A number of positions are currently being posted and are opening, and they seem to be mostly construction-related currently. Now, what's interesting about this expansion is a cell recycling plant has an important role to play. If Tesla achieves metal recovery, it will again dramatically reduce the battery production costs, making its electric vehicles even more affordable. I think one of the things Tesla does to recycle their their batteries, by the way, is mm-hmm. to take, uh, when they do a refurbished battery pack, they're taking the best of the modules, um, testing them, seeing that they test good, that they have a high CAC value, grouping the uh, modules that have similar CAC values together and putting them back into a pack and effectively remanufacturing that pack simply by putting the, uh, the good, the good uh, modules into new batteries and then taking the bad modules and taking them through the destructive recycling process. Yeah. And, you know, it's speculation. Uh, I mean, we talk to Tesla, they tell us a fair share, but there's certain processes like this particular one that uh, we just can't get uh, any information about. Right. I wonder what would, uh, you know, with uh, J.B. Strobel now on the Tesla Board of Directors, how does Redwood Materials get impacted by Tesla expanding their recycling capabilities so much internally? And it almost sounds like that could be a conflict of interest. It does. It 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 seems kind of odd. I guess... I don't know, I guess maybe it's the idea that you've got so many electric vehicles going out into the marketplace right now, and all of virtually all these electric vehicles still have battery warranties. Mm-hmm. So if a, there's a battery failure, and we've seen that the battery failure rates are incredibly low early in the life cycle of these cars, there's not much to that market from the car battery side yet. Mm-hmm. But that market is going to grow exponentially over the next few years. And it doesn't matter if it's Tesla or Redwood Materials or like the, the company here in Phoenix, uh, LI Cycle. Um, there are a few different companies like that. Um, they're all going to have more batteries than they could hope to, hope to retrieve once these cars start getting to end of life. It would seem to me that uh, with JB involved on the board, um, that uh, it could be an issue of broad versus narrow in that Tesla would be recycling their own batteries. Right. Uh, whereas Redwood takes virtually anything from cell phones to toothbrushes to power tools to, you know, you name it, anything that has a, a battery in it. Um, one thing they did mention, however, is that um, Tesla batteries are 100% recyclable. Now, if you think about that, that's um, that's a pretty dramatic shift in technology. Very few things have been 100% recyclable. Yeah, that's that's really impressive because you think about um, 100%. Okay, that means they have figured out potentially a way to recycle the coolant, mm-hmm. the plastic that sits on top of the modules, um, the uh, you know the the different aluminum and metals and stuff that stainless are inside steel, the modules, the gravity, stainless steel, the uh, all of that stuff. They're saying they're able to recycle. I'm I'm really impressed by that. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's very planet friendly. Yes. And like the article pointed out, this may reduce the cost of their product even further. 
It may because they don't have to go out and try to mine and refine lithium nearly as much. Now I'm wondering, does the article, because uh, I, I read through and didn't see this, are they focusing only on destructive recycling or are they even doing destructive recycling? Yeah. Um, we, yeah. I, I don't think they talk about the methods they go through. It may be that uh, that right now there are so few modules or, uh, coming back for recycling that the only recycling they're doing internally is the kind where you're pulling your battery apart either by hand or by machine, pulling out the good modules, reusing the good modules, and sending everything else off to maybe somebody like Redwood for destructive recycling process. Sure. Yeah, two processes there are possible. YouTube, George Lewis says, charge point should remind people that you can simply charge it like your phone overnight. You know, I think that's the message that charge point is trying to get out to people, in fact. So thank you, George. Uh, Roger Starkey on YouTube says, the charge point idea is already a thing. It's called graze charging. It removes the must charge at home opinion. If you're using the car, you're going somewhere. If you're not, then why are you charging in the first place? Mm -hmm. Good point. YouTube, PYGLKB, he says, I agree with the always charging notion. When I'm going somewhere in an hour or so, I'll find a level two charger nearby and plug in. I think a lot of people who are EV drivers already do a lot of this. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I had not mentioned in that article was uh, a study done of electric vehicle drivers in Australia. Uh, Australia is notable because it's a large continent with a low population and not a lot of infrastructure, especially EV charging infrastructure, even compared to here in the States. And Tesla owners drive their cars just as far and just as much as gasoline car owners. They just don't think about the charging. And the, the whole right. idea of range anxiety tends to go away once you have an electric vehicle and you realize that it's not really a thing. And you've driven it enough months to where you've never had a problem with uh, running out of juice. Yeah. Now, for all of those that we say, every once in a while you do run across the guy like our TikTok video. Right. Yeah. This car's stuck in a parking lot. He can't even make the corner to get into the Tesla station and people are yelling at him. Cutting it way too close, yes. Uh, YouTube Highlander video team, you get more viewers when you acknowledge posts. Interesting. Okay. I think yeah, he, we're very behind. Is yeah, I think. I think he means yeah. the the comments on the video. Yeah. Yes. Um, YouTube Roger Starkey uh, Quantum Scape. Uh, isn't that a semi solid design? It's not new. He says, which of the big three were in with them? GM. Roger, I'm not sure. Speculation there. Instagram, Mustafa Mahasne. Uh, hello, I have a question of anywhere. Can you help answer it? Yes. Give us your question and we'll we'll answer it. Yes. Uh, Highlander, YouTube. Uh, go team Cass. There you go. Cass is getting face. a little love there. YouTube, Highlander. American English is the hardest language to learn. Ask any immigrant. Okay. You mean if I were to tell you they're going to go over there. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, right. YouTube, Ramon Hurt, will AI seek out alien life forms? Now there's a question Ooh, that we had pondered. Question. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, wow, okay. That one you want to think about and talk to Jesse about. Yeah, Jesse, I think we found our next Sunday podcast theme. Sorry, we're working on questions back here. I missed that. Okay. We'll, we'll update you later then. Uh, T. Barrera on YouTube uh, says, electric vehicles are the tech of the near future. There will always be another technology coming along. Wonderful. That's why it's an exciting time to live. Yep. YouTube, mega wilderness, semis are devastating to the roads. Yeah, and you know, the fuel and the emissions and uh, those statistics are definitely uh, off the chart compared to passenger cars. Oh yeah, they, uh, uh, I, I know that, I know the percentages are much, much higher in terms of road damage, in terms of pollution. I saw something uh, that said uh, it's possible that the class eight trucks produce as much as 25% of the carbon monoxide pollution in the United States. 
right. or the automobile pollution. So um, yet they're a critical piece of our transportation and commerce. One of Highlander's uh, slogans that we usually insert during these podcasts, he says, P.S., kindness is still free. Oh, did I miss the alien one? Is that what you're talking about? The yes. alien one, yeah. Yeah, I will seek aliens. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Thought-provoking. That's probably the theme for next Sunday after we've thought about it for a few more days. YouTube, Roger Starkey. Oh, you know what? We're not going to be doing the AI podcast Sundays anymore. Yeah, we're looking for time to move it, just with yeah. holidays and stuff coming up. But I think it's probably worth, you know, still doing it. We'll just have to figure out the the details. We'll let everybody know. So we think we're going to do one more this Sunday. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, YouTube, Roger Starkey. The heavy EV opinion falls down in the land of the F one fifty. Tesla vehicles are on par with, for instance, BMW ICE cars. Uh, Roger's point is well taken there. Most of your pickup truck or light truck style vehicles, those full-size pickup trucks, your large SUVs, um, they run anywhere from 6,500 to as much as 9,000 pounds. Uh, the Ford Excursion, that, that mammoth SUV that Ford made for a few years, actually tipped the scales at nearly 10,000 pounds. And um, a, a Tesla Model S is... 5,800 pounds. Yeah, about 6,000, yeah. About 6,000 pounds. The, uh, you know, our, our Volvo EX40 runs about 4,200 pounds. It's not the 2,300 to 2,500 pounds of a small compact pick, a car or, or a sports car. Um, but at the same time, they're right in range, in the same range as most ICE vehicles. Mm-hmm, right. Um, all right, YouTube, Mega Wilderness, says semis are the reason that axle loading and weight bridges exist. When, when's the last time you were compelled to weigh your car? <laughs> Good point. Good point. Roger Starkey continues and says, when was the last time you were compelled to weigh your lifted pickup? <laughs> you know, I was going to insert something there, and now that it's, it's continued, I have to do this. I went to Safeway the other day yeah. to buy a watermelon, right? And I'm in my little Tessa Roadster, and this guy parks up next to me there, and he's got this big Lariat pickup truck lifted with tires that were taller than my Tessa Roadster, diesel just, you know, banging away. And he's a little guy, and he gets out to go buy some groceries. I'm thinking, what is the point of... <laughs> now, I know that you're going to differ on this, Aaron. This is, you, you have a justification for this, Yeah, right? what's wrong with little guys driving big trucks? <laughs> I, I don't understand. <laughs> Overcompensating, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> YouTube Highlander love the Beverly Hills uh, uh, belies almost as oh uh, the hillbillies. Okay, sorry, I didn't see the separation there. So he loved the the Beverly Hillbillies almost as much as my love, my little Dodge Grand Caravan. Yes. Uh, yeah. Great show. Mm -hmm. uh, YouTube Mustafa Alma Alahazne. Um. Hello, I've been following your pages on TikTok and YouTube and other social media. I've been trying to be a Tesla certified. Can you please guide us on how to start and where to go or any website help? Now, if you're a repair organization that's trying to get Tesla certification, there is no such thing yet, unless you're a body shop and that they will outsource. If your question is that you're, um, a, uh, that you're a private individual that wants to break into the EV space and get some experience, then I would suggest working for one of these EV manufacturers. And again, as I've said many times, start at the bottom. Start as a janitor. Impress them. If you are uh, imp impressive, they will quickly promote you because right. they badly need talent. You'll find as well that uh, some of the general skills that are helpful... Uh, include learning a little bit more about electronic engineering, uh, learning some about software engineering, especially Linux, and uh, of course the easiest of the three, uh, learn how to learn how to fix cars, even ice cars. Instagram Fabrics Boss says Tesla is the best car, and then from YouTube Ramon Hurt says, "Do any of you guys eat at Filiberto's Mexican food?" Yeah, actually, I do. Yes. I've, I've heard great things about it. I never have yet. Yeah. 
It's uh, it's definitely great food, and it's fast. It's the yep. reason why I had this fantastic body. <laughs> Put a camera on him. <laughs> there he is. All right. <laughs> Richard, you're you're not on. We want to hear you. Yeah. Oh, my apologies. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. So there there's some lore behind here in Arizona. We have like Filibertos, Rulibertos, Tulibertos, Eulibertos, Federicos, Edericos, and they're all brothers. You know, we were wondering that the other day. We're driving along. And said, now which one is that? Don't they keep changing their name or what's going on? So they're brothers that are actually. They um and they're all the same theme in the same format. Did not know that. Family members, yeah. Yeah. So they're all they're all I think okay. cousins and brothers, and they were all one thing at one point in time. They all split off, did their own thing, just didn't change the menu. Oh, okay. So yeah. so Julio Berto's is the same as Filiberto's, is the same as <laughs> all of the rest. All the rest. It's kind of like how in the Midwest we have Fleet Farm and Farm and Fleet. I grew up with it as Fleet Farm. And they used to be two brothers, except for they had a bit of a tiff. Uh -huh. And so now they are separate. So one is Fleet Farm and the other one is Farm and Fleet. Same exact thing. It's like your Home Depot. It's just more like local, central to oh, okay. uh, the Midwest. It's always fun when you have these family feuds and they're business people, and then they splinter into variations of the same business. Oh, yes. Um, let's see. Uh, Roman Hurt, he says, I don't work at Tesla any longer. I left there in 2020. Oh, you did tell me that. Yes. Thank you, Ramon. Um, but we appreciate your Tesla insights. They're invaluable. YouTube, Roger Starkey, to confirm, Jeff Don is one below uh, a, a Nobel Prize winner, okay? Uh, battery researcher at Dalhousie University in Canada, affiliated closely with Tesla since 2016. This team is exceptional. Wait for the Tesla Semi 4680 combination in Nevada. It'll be a game changer. Oh, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. And we will, I definitely want to learn more about Jeff Don now. Yeah. YouTube, T. Barrera, Pete, thank you for cor correctly pronouncing Nevada. All right. <laughs> uh, YouTube, Mega Wilderness says Tesla needs to recycle their dud batteries and the waste. Uh, interesting. Okay. Um, and then Lito Idaho is back with us. It's been a little while since he's been on. Thank you for joining us. He says, Elon Musk is the Lord of the plugs. True. And then YouTube, Roger Starkey says, Tesla does any, does recycle all battery waste. It's a well-documented fact from recollection mentioned in the impact reports. In fact, while I was looking up information, because uh, so, I like to look up background information on our articles and go down rabbit holes and stuff like that, mm -hmm. I was on the Tesla website this morning and they <laughs> say right on their website, we recycle 100% of our battery materials. Excellent. Uh, Ramon actually confirms it. He says, Tesla scraps bad modules. They have people pull them apart and recycle the cells. You know, we often wonder what happens to the Tesla Roadster batteries, which have 6,831 cells in them, mm -hmm. weigh 1,000 pounds. They get sent to Lathrop to be remanufactured. They make new sheets. What happens to those old sheets? I've even offered to buy them from them because we repair those sheets, and they would right. be invaluable to put other cars back on the road during the interim while the uh, you know Tesla production uh, process continues to make those new packs. But yeah, it's good to hear that they're recycling 100%. It's very environmentally responsible. And Ramon Hurt co continues and says, I've personally stacked up pallets of modules for them to scrap. Interesting. YouTube, Nalvers53 says, I wonder why some people think the concern over where to find a charging station to charge your electric vehicle is greater than the concern over where to find a gas station. Okay. Excellent point, and I can't agree with you more. It's, uh, I think right now the, the bigger fear, or at least my bigger fear is, uh, if I go to a gas station, I'm going to get gasoline, and it's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. If I go to a charging station, uh, depending on the brand of charging station I go to, and this is more with my Volvo than my Tesla, some with the Tesla as well, um, is that charging station going to actually be functional? 
Mm -hmm. because only at any given point in time, it seems like only about eight out of 10 charging stations or charge, charge ports that are available are functional if it's not Tesla. Right. If it's not Tesla, yeah, I knew you were going to add that. That's yeah, of course. If it's Tesla, it's as, it's as reliable as a gasoline station. YouTube, Roger Starkey, QuantumScape was in with VW. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, YouTube, Crunch to Grace Hopper, uh, like number 17 from Newport Beach, SoCal, catching up from 76 minutes down. Uh, it says, I was up late monitoring uh, Middle East conflict. Uh, oh. Smash that like thumb, y'all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Crunch. I don't think that Middle East conflict is going to have any resolution here anytime soon. Unfortunately. <clears throat> Instagram. SJV Tesla says 10,000 pounds. That was probably from an earlier reference, what these vehicles weigh. Yeah. All right. News item. Tesla lithium refinery to start production in Q1 of 2024. So this is um, from an article uh, printed October 6th. And they're talking about a lithium refinery in Robstown, Texas, which will start production on the first day of 2024. Um, it will be uh, commissioned um, or commissioning the assets roughly the first of next year, and that will continue in earnest over the first half of next year. Now, this one's not going to be very large. They proposed a um, $3.8 million donation for the roads near the lithium refinery. This is a fairly small town. I think somewhere here, I, yeah, there it is. It is a town in Nueces, Nueces County, Texas. It is a western suburb of Corpus Christi, and it was founded in 1906, named after Robert Driscoll, Robstown. Um, so they are going to be opening this lithium refinery. It will only empl uh, employ 165 people, but they claim there's some pretty high paying jobs there. So for those of you interested, they're looking for metallurgical chemical engineers and a variety of lab type people. Um, if you're near Las Cruces and you want to work for Tesla, this may be a good bet for you. This is kind of exciting. It's Pretty close to the uh, Texas Gigafactory. Mm -hmm. uh, Austin and Corpus Christi are in the same general area of the state. Um, and I'm anxious to see when Tesla's next lithium refining factory goes into place. Uh, how long is it before we hear an announcement that they're going to add lithium refining up in Nevada? Mm -hmm. That's that's just that's my own personal opinion. I think it's going to be coming in the it kind of completes future. all the processes there. Yeah. All right. Looks like we're getting to the end of our podcast. We've got an hour and a half into this one. Really appreciate everybody joining us. Um, we are still working on Instagram's uh, green screen image. And um, yeah. Um, well, we will have uh, tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock Mountain Time uh, the Roadster, the Roadster podcast. podcast. Yes. Thursday, we'll continue with this one. Tomorrow afternoon, we are going to have a special time to kick off our communication products podcast as well. Uh, that one's going to be where you hear a little bit more about the history, what got us into uh, Gruber, uh, into the company Gruber Industries in the first place, how what what led you to found it, things like that. So I'm ex very excited about that one. The, uh, yeah, we'll have a lot of nostalgic pictures of the early days here at the company and uh, how we've emerged into a manufacturer that supplies data centers. Today we did some short videos, and uh, one of them was, you probably didn't realize that we're in the furniture business, even though we're into high tech, but we make furniture for data centers, mm -hmm. racks, shelves, cable management panels, things that hold servers, and not only hold them, but connect them together. So those of you interested, we've got two videos or two podcasts tomorrow then. It'll be the Roadster Podcast at 10 and at 4 in the afternoon, Mountain Standard Time. We'll have our first uh, data communication products podcast, which will, from that point forward, be broadcast Monday mornings at 10 a.m. We had a problem with uh, streaming services coming online uh, this last or uh, yesterday. So look forward to seeing you guys again, and I hope uh, you have a wonderful rest of the day.